This reserve was created when Conniskey Power Station was built and this bit of land was put aside as mitigation for the building of the reserve, uh, the building of the power station, sorry, and made into reserve in 1974, I think it was. So it's mainly because the power station has taken up some salt marsh that used to be used by wading birds uh, that were roosting at high tide and so on. Um, and so the, 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 the main reason for this reserve is to provide a place for ducks and wading birds to have somewhere to go uh, when it's high tide and so on. The salt marsh habitat in the estuary makes up 7% of the, the UK proportion of salt marsh habitat, which is, is huge. So it would be a really huge loss if, if that was to be lost. Um, it provides a really important stop-off location for migratory birds. Um, but the estuary has huge importance culturally and, and locally for the communities as well. You know, they've, they've lived and worked around the estuary uh, for generations and um, it's provided a source of food, employment, um, and a recreational environment for people to spend time around. The Dee estuary is one of the most important estuaries in Britain. Apart, the Wash is the main one because it has a huge number of birds there, but we have vast numbers of birds here, hundreds of, 200,000, 300,000 birds, sometimes in winter. So, I mean, it is a very important estuary. Uh, and we're part of it. And although there's this huge estuary, for example, one species I know, uh, if you want to see it, you come here, and that's a bird called a spotted redshank. And they will gather down here on the mud. Not very, not, not very many of them, perhaps 20, perhaps 30 on a, on a really good day. But it's interesting, they only come here, it seems. You, you won't find them anywhere else on the reserve, on, on the estuary. The estuary is full of wildlife. It's gorgeous. We've got a pair of binoculars and a little my first bird book sort of thing. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's, it's gorgeous. So it's mainly birds, but of course there are other things here as well. People who know about butterflies, moths. Um, I th think somebody looks into uh, lizards and whatever. We've seen moles, we've seen badgers. We've seen foxes. Um, Bird-wise, we've seen most varieties of birds common to the UK around here, uh, from buzzards, um, owls, and then all the finches and different varieties of tits. They're all there, everything. Common lizards, as I've just been told that they are, not sand lizards. So we've now got a common lizard. It's a male common lizard. So I know it's a male because he's got this beautiful colouring underneath the orange and the black dots underneath um, and also the penile bulge here. If you notice this one's got quite a short tail so at some point it has lost its tail but it has regrown as well and he's also got fantastic speckled look on top of him. So this is a fully grown adult male. He's, he's quite cold but he'll get a little bit wriggly because he'll be warming up in my hands right now. Um, and his, and his feet, that reminds me of Velcro. They're really, really sticky, and that's what they use to, to climb up objects and up grass. So we've had a male and we've had a female, so we've definitely got a breeding population here. Well, it's an attraction at the end of the day, in my personal opinion. Um, if people are interested in wildlife and they wanted to come down, we'll certainly open the gates and let people in and explore. Citizen science is a good one. Um, love getting people involved in citizen science so so amphib amphibian reptiles do don't get the kind of support say the fluffy mammals do like hedgehogs and stuff and um, so we always try and encourage people we, we train people so to be able to id and understand a little bit about amphibian and reptiles and where they'll live and then we encourage people to actively go out and look for the creatures um, and then put them into the local record centres. And then that for us builds us a picture of where reptiles are, what, what habitats are occupying. And in areas like this, if, if somebody came and did some surveys on here, um, we'd find out particular areas on this site that, that they're using. And then you could try and enhance those areas or make those areas bigger. It's quite difficult because we've got about 6 million records. But yeah, we're, things like the pine marching reintroductions in North Wales that 
we, we get records of them way outside of where they were reintroduced from. So they, they turn up sort of 20, 30, 40, 50 kilometres from where they were released almost. So it's that sort of level of information that we're getting in from everybody that's looking because obviously the people reintroducing pine martins can't necessarily keep tabs on them all. And if they suddenly turn up in Clandidno, well out of range, they're not going to be looking in Clandidno, are they? But somebody with feeding birds in their garden might see something really interesting. And then, of course, you get rare birds coming in on migration, turning up on people's bird feeders. We often get records like that, which you would never hear of otherwise, but people go, oh, that's a strange bird. I've never seen one of them before. I'll take a photo and I'll send it into Covnod and see what they say. And we'll all, even if we don't know what species it is, we know people who will be able to help and we can put people in touch with the right people. And yeah, it's, it's just about improving people's knowledge of the wildlife in their area as much as anything. And we also offer nice introductory courses, ID courses. So we'll get experts to come into North Wales, we'll bring them in, set, set us up in a room with microscopes and PowerPoint presentations, and we'll have a, a nice day introducing people to a species group. So just last week we did mosses, for instance, and the, the amount of interest in mosses is amazing. You assume that a moss is just a little green thing that grows at the side of your foot, but no, we, we, had, we set up this one-day course and we were, we were booked out in three hours. So we had to offer another course a few days later. So, yeah, there's there's definitely a demand for people to understand their wildlife and the nature that they see as they're on their day-to-day -day walks. But we would like to be in a position to provide it and obviously do it in a nice, cost-effective manner as well. And it's definitely a sign it's in good health, um, and it's also a sign that they've they've managed to they've managed to cling on in pockets. Um, through through a kind of more well an urban landscape um, which has seen lots of developments and changes over the years and um, we have got the railway line which does allow these species to move up and down and take advantage of areas like this so so they've managed to cling on and then with regeneration coming in and, and more focus on looking after these 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 areas um, also the, the footpaths as well it, it just provides an enhanced habitat where they can thrive more. So it's it's definitely a, it's definitely a good thing for the species. I think in Flintshire, uh, partly because of the industry, often some of the communities along the estuary uh, don't have um, easy access to the estuary itself. And I think that's something that we're working on, trying to improve, trying to rebuild that connection with the nature and the wildlife that's on the estuary and make sure that people can um, access it easily, can appreciate it, can enjoy it um, just in their day-to-day -day lives when they're, you know, walking around their communities.